Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of Hashtag Ask Firebase. And today I am just super excited because we have the one and only Roman Nurek here to help us answer some questions. And Roman is in UX at Firebase and Roman spends most of his time every day just... What, what does UX do, Roman? Well, you know, a lot of people think of UX as, you know, they're the, the designers that are picking the right shade of blue. But UX is a lot more than that. We do everything from, you know, looking at a given problem that the user has and trying to figure out how can we uh, create a series of user interfaces and, and uh, different like things that they can interact with to help them accomplish a certain set of goals. So figuring out how should something should look, but also how should it work, how should it feel, what are the the different uh, tasks or different ways to accomplish those tasks. And a really really big part of it is also observing users and seeing you know what are the challenges that they're facing when they try to do something and figuring out how can we make that better for them. So how do I pick out what shade of blue? <laughs> I mean, uh, that's, that's a hard question to answer. That, that's probably for another video. What's the hex code, Roman? 039BE5. That's the Firebase blue. It's really sad that I know that, but I, I have a thing for hex codes. I, can, I think I know a lot of hex codes and it kind of scares me sometimes. Well, let's start answering some questions. This question comes from Akash on Twitter. And Akash asks, what kind of customers is Firebase hosting targeting? Since the same thing can be done on GCP. So this is actually a really interesting question. And for those of you who don't know, GCP stands for Google Cloud Platform. And Firebase hosting is built on top of Google Cloud Platform. But we use a lot of the pieces that pretty much you would build anyways if you were building a hosting provider. In this case, if you are serving lots of static files for your website, what we do is, is you deploy them out to Firebase hosting and we stick them in CDN uh, edge, edge servers all around the world. So if we have a user in Tokyo requesting files, they don't have to go all the way to the United States and then send that data all the way back. Instead, the, your files are stored in a little, well, probably not little, but a server in Tokyo. And so that way the latency of returning the response is just much, much faster. And while Firebase hosting is, uh, its core is off static files, it actually has grown beyond that to do dynamic uh, server code. So if you pair it up with other GCP services like Cloud Functions or recently Cloud Run, favorite of mine, you can run server code and you can actually take the generated response and you can store that in the CDN cache for a certain amount of time. And that way you get a really big performance hit because you don't have to keep going back and regenerating every single time a user hits that endpoint. There's also uh, dynamic links. I think we recently uh, launched an integration where you can set up, like you could basically do URL shortening on your uh, hosting URLs, your hosting domains through so dynamic I get my own awesome. custom domain for Basically, URL shortening. It's awesome. It's pretty sweet. So that's a great question, Akash. Thank you for asking. Next question. So this next question comes from me. Host question. And I use uh, Firestore a lot and for its offline capabilities. And while it handles it really, really well, it actually leaves me with a bit of this, uh, this problem. When a user goes offline, do I let them know with some user interface, some notification or something, it's like, hey, you're offline. You may not receive, probably won't receive updates from other people until you go back online. Uh, or should I just you know, keep it as a seamless experience and not burden them with this whole switching of states? You know, going offline is cool and all, handling that, but what you really need to pay attention to is coming back online and dealing with that and managing that well. Because going offline, that's cool. And, you know, things can, you can like mention to the user that, hey, now you're offline, but coming back online, that's the moment where what the user was doing offline can kind of blow up in their face. If you don't handle that well, if you don't save those changes correctly, if you don't m manage the merging process, if like somebody did something uh, while they were offline um, that would conflict, then you're really in a situation where the user is super frustrated because all their stuff is lost. So you need to be really careful. The number one thing to think about is don't frustrate the user and make sure that you, you don't lose their work. 
Because that is the word. How many times have you like had a file or like a pa- you're writing a paper for college or something, and it just you know, for some reason it's all gone. I have get rebased before. Yes. Oh my, yeah. Or like if you do like RM RF or something, an entire folder, and you don't realize that that really important thing is there. It's the same thing if you're working offline, especially if it's like for a couple of hours or a couple of minutes or whatever. If you do a lot of stuff and then it goes away, you need to be really careful not to lose that stuff. So I think that it's it's obviously important to provide visual feedback and just to provide some information about here's the current state of things. Uh, but then when they come back online, if there's a situation where you're at risk of losing their information or mangling what they did offline, you got to be really careful to potentially you know give the user options. Like here are a couple of things that you can do. Um, and ideally, it's not like the most common thing that they're working on something while somebody else is doing the same thing. But you want to be really, really careful to handle those cases. So if you need to spend you know, a bunch of engineering time to make sure that that is really, really good and that that's handled well, um, then that is time well worth whatever. It's worth spending that time. So make sure, while it might not be the most common thing, you have to handle those moments of potential frustration yes. and make them as just positive for the user as possible. Absolutely. Amazing answer for an amazing question. Roman, what's that over there? And Oh, and it's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> this next question comes from Mainya on Twitter. And Mainya asks, are there any plans to have a SQL database in Firebase anytime soon? So Mainya, there are tons of differences between NoSQL databases like Firestore and SQL databases. And I could totally go into that, but that would be such a crazy long video. And actually, Todd Kerpelman on the Firebase team did an amazing video on this in his Get to Know Cloud Firestore series. So you should totally watch that. Link is in the description. But essentially, Firestore is a real-time database that wants to optimize out to just you know huge scale of millions of users. And it doesn't provide certain things uh, that uh, queries that SQL provides to prevent any scaling in that. So a lot of people want to essentially want that real-time connection to their application, but they also need to be able to do really fancy uh, queries and cross joins and you know crazy stuff like that. And what I've seen a lot of people do to have the best of both worlds is they do a cloud function to send data to a SQL database instance, so like a uh, Cloud SQL from Google Cloud Platform, or they'll use um, like BigQuery or send off to BigQuery to do really awesome joins. So effectively, you have you treat your Firestore database as your real time uh, application point, and then for any type of uh, business uh, purposes or any type of of querying, you can send that off to a SQL instance. But if you are still really in love with SQL and you want to write SQL queries inside of your application, you can still do that. A Google developer expert named Joseph Sale wrote a JavaScript library called FireSQL. And FireSQL allows you to write a SQL query in a string template, and it will convert it behind the scenes with magic to a Firestore query. And so you can do things like select all from here, where this is equal to this. And there's so much more you can do with it. So if you're interested in using that, we will leave a link in the description to the GitHub page and also the NPM package. So thank you so much, Manya, for asking. So that is all the questions that we have time for today. I want to thank the one and only. Are, there, are you the only? Or is there other, you know, run into other? There are other lyrics? Romans, but I don't know about other Roman lyrics. It's in the true. world, I don't, know, I don't know. If you're out there, please say hi. I mean, I'd love to meet you. Thank you to Roman Nurek for stopping by, talking to us about amazing UX things, what color of blue to use in our buttons. Uh, thank you so much. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to all the other Firebase content that we are going to be releasing. So thank you all so much for stopping by, and we will see you in the next episode of Hashtag Ask Firebase. <laughs> Roman, I think you have something on your shirt. Oh, it's a question. <laughs>